Hi, welcome to the 2020 Calabasas City Council Candidate Forum. I'm Dr. Lori Baker Shenna, your moderator for today's forum. I am a Southern California native who served as a professor of journalism at California State University Northridge for 25 years before starting a leadership consulting and professional speaking business. It is truly an honor to be moderating this incredibly important event. Thank you for joining us tonight. And please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This evening, we will be talking with four candidates who are running for the two open city council seats and who will take this opportunity to explain why they deserve your vote on November 3rd. The candidates will discuss a number of issues important to Calabasas residents, ranging from homelessness to cell service. Before discussing the format and ground rules, I'd like to welcome the four city council candidates joining us. The, the candidates are joining us via Zoom and will be answering in an order we just determined by a random drawing. They are Alicia Weintraub, Dennis Washburn, Susan Fredericks Plussard, Peter Kraut. Thank you all for being with us this evening. I would also like to thank everyone who has joined us via Zoom, as well as those watching on CTV or online. Let me share the ground rules for tonight's forum. In a few moments, each candidate will be given two minutes to introduce themselves and their platform. I will then present the panel with the first question. Each candidate will be given two minutes to respond to that question. We will be asking eight questions and please note that every question was submitted by a Calabasas resident. The candidates will all take turns going first in answering the questions. At the conclusion of the forum, each candidate will be given three minutes to give a closing statement. All of the candidates have been given the forum ground rules before appearing this evening and have agreed to avoid cross-talking and interruption of other candidates. Candidates, when your time is up, I will simply say thank you and move on to the next candidate. So let's begin with the opening statement. Each candidate, again, will have two minutes and we will begin tonight with Alicia Weintraub. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am proud to serve as your current mayor. I took an oath as mayor on December 11th, 2019. That was only 38 weeks ago, a relatively short amount of time, but in some ways it feels like a lifetime ago. So much has happened in those months. We had a terrible helicopter crash in our city. The city manager resigned. We had anti-Semitic rantings displayed and we've seen nationwide protests over policing and racism. However, through all of this, I made sure our residents remained our first focus. Just a little bit of background information about me. My family and I are so pleased to live in Calabasas. My husband and I have two children who attend AC Stell. I have been working in local government my entire career in cities throughout Southern California, and I have a master's degree in public policy. Prior to being elected to the city council, I was on the city's planning and environmental commissions. My goal when elected to the city council was to make government more responsive to our residents and always ensure that residents' needs were put first. I sought to improve transparency, improve communication, preserve our open space, and work on public safety and quality of life issues impacting our community. I held community coffees so I can engage with residents outside of City Hall and send weekly community emails during the pandemic. When I was sworn in as mayor, my first order of business was to meet with representatives from each neighborhood with our sheriff and fire department to discuss ways to improve evacuation and communications. We have made great progress since the Woolsey fire, but we still need to work every day on issues related to fire and earthquake safety. 
The greatest challenge we continue to face as a community is the global health pandemic. I have worked tirelessly since the pandemic began to make sure that we were doing all that we can to keep our community safe and help our businesses survive. Another big issue that impacts our community is our poor wireless service. I help lead the charge to look at wireless ordinances. We have a lot of work to continue to do in our community and I would love to continue doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis Washburn, you're next. Good afternoon. Growing up in San Francisco and Chicago, my boyhood heroes were a masked te Texas Ranger and his faithful Native American sidekick and their horses, Silver and Scout. I still hum the William Tell Overture, hoping for heroic deeds and courage and honesty and people never <clears throat> shooting to kill, just like the Lone Ranger and Tonto. They always saved the town and the townspeople from themselves and the bad guys. He left a silver bullet to remind them of the tasks ahead for them. How could I have known that the Lone Ranger would live in Calabasas on the lake until 1999? <clears throat> he sent me this picture about him in costume and autographed to the city of Calabasas. And <clears throat> here we are today um, wearing masks of our own and no silver bullets. All of us on our scenic corridors preserved by our first ordinance enacted that day along with our oak tree preservation ordinance facing many daunting crises of health, safety, fire, even the lives of all living things in these special regions. That's why I'm running for a sixth term on the city council. In my first five terms, 1991 to 2011, Calabasas declared we would work hard to preserve our environment and people with all the tools we could develop. Zoning, development impact mitigations, managed growth planning, scenic ridgeline protections, mobility and communication systems, parks and parklands where we had none in 1991. Our own library and civic center to meet and argue and plan the future. Now we face a respiratory plague, economic collapse, and threats to the environment we cherish. I need your help and your votes to create our future, not just hope for it. And I plan to be a volunteer council member if elected. I'm not asking for money or spending money on a campaign. I ask for your references, not your endorsements. And I'll say more during the question and answers and in the conclusion, I have a significant action plan. Thank you. Susan Fredericks Pussar. Good evening, residents of Calabasas. My name is Dr. Susan Fredericks Plusard. I have lived in Calabasas for 23 wonderful years with my husband and two children. I have run my successful dental practice for 36 years in Woodland Hills. Both of my children attended public grade schools in, and Calabasas High School. My son will graduate from medical school in May. My daughter has both a dental and medical degree and is now in a head and facial surgery residency. There are less than 500 women in the U.S. who have these dual degrees. The tree is like the apples. And clearly, the public school system provided a great foundation for my children's future. For the last 12 years, I have spent thousands of hours as a volunteer dentist and clinic director at a nonprofit that provided dental care to the underserved in the Valley. I served on their board for eight years. I was then asked to join the boards of the UCLA School of Dentistry and West Hills Hospital. I believe these boards and director positions and running a successful business demonstrate my leadership skills. My master's degree in public health was with a focus on finance, policy, and management. For more than a decade, my extensive public service has been outside of Calabasas. And now I want my use, use my business and finance experience to help the city through these times. A public health education may seem like an unconventional path to the city council, but I can think of no better preparation for the road ahead. Other issues that motivated me to run were the city's poor response to the Woolsey fire and multiple articles about inappropriate spending. I will be a new set of eyes, ideas, perspective, and oversight. Calabasas, it's time for a change. Thank you. Thank you. And Peter Kraut. Thank you and good evening. I've served on your planning commission for the last four years. During that time, I've rejected mansionization and overdevelopment. I've held all our applicants accountable to our development code, to our general plan and to our scenic corridor guidelines. 
My voting record proves that I can and will protect our open space. I'm the only candidate endorsed by the Calabasas Coalition, Save Open Space, and the Sierra Club. I support the passage of State Senate Bill 474 that would prohibit the creation or approval of a new development in a very high fire hazard severity zone, such as Calabasas. My greatest accomplishment on the Planning Commission isn't a project or a vote, it's a change in attitude. I maintain my promise to review the facts, to listen to our community before every vote, and to vote only in the best interest of the city and its residents. Now I'm ready to bring that same spirit to the city council. If elected, I promise to maintain the highest level of transparency and pledge never to profit from any involvement with the city. I'll bring a unique skill set and a fresh perspective to an experienced group of city council members. The position requires collaboration and consensus. As a planning commissioner, I've worked with many of our commissioners and city departments. I know the ropes already, I'll hit the ground running. My wife, Leslie, and I have lived in Calabasas for 15 years. Our kids went to LVUSD public schools and are both in college now. I want the city to continue to provide the highest level of support to our local schools. At a time like this, we should be contributing more to our school district, not less. I'll work with the school district and encourage our neighboring cities to do the same. I have the endorsement of all five school board members. In summary, I have the skills and the experience to make a positive change on our city council, to protect our natural environment and to uphold the values that we all share. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, we're gonna start with question number one. What do you consider the three main challenges or problems that you intend to focus on to improve Calabasas? Alicia, we're gonna start with you. Great, thank you. I think the three biggest issues that we need to focus are number one, the pandemic and continuing to keep our residents safe and help our businesses survive. The second issue that we have to deal with is our city budget. And we've had such serious impacts to the budget as a result of the pandemic and how we are going to respond to the budget cuts and make sure that we do not change any services to our residents. And the third issue that I believe is the most important is disaster preparedness and the way we respond and continue to prepare regarding fires and earthquakes. There's not a fire season anymore. Fires can happen any day at any time and we have to continue preparing and doing everything that we can. So those are the three main issues and lots of others, but those are the top three. Thank you. Dennis? I'm glad I'm second because I agree with everything that Alicia said, but critically, I think we need to develop um, fire life safety action zones that are along our scenic corridors or highways. We enacted those in 1991 and We've done a good job of protecting them and stopping, slowing down development, you know, that has had threatened our community. But going forward, you know, um, the, the very scenic corridors that we've preserved have become the fuses and the bombs that threaten us now with the fires and with the public safety issues and the communications threats. You know, we're working hard to fix those things, but um, those are all critical actions. We need fire protection, suppression, and recovery to save lives and homes and schools and the wildlife and the corridors that we've preserved in our biomes and our public safety system for communications, evacuation and policing um, in the emergencies that we continue to face. Those are critical issues I think that we need to address. And uh, I would urge the city if I'm elected to launch fire life safety action zones and the plans to deal with them, just like we did the watershed protection zones that started in Las Virginis, Malibu Canyon, and then went to uh, the Parkway, Calabasas, uh, McCoy Creek Canyon. And we have still to deal with the watershed planning on the east side of the city on our creeks that go to the LA River. We have a headwaters corner that's on the corner of Old Topang and Mulholland that was intended to be an institute or dealing with these kinds of things. So if we actually um, take the next steps and deal with you know, the fire life safety issues, and we'll talk more about the life issues later because that's all of us. Thank you. 
Susan? Thank you. Um, I would agree with my, my two predecessors um, completely. Obviously, the, the biggest threat facing Calabasas right now is to get COVID under control, not only in Calabasas, but in our sister cities that also um, are part of the Las Virginias Unified School District. I would like to see a collaborative, um, a collaboration between our three cities to really bring down COVID in our community and to ask as much as possible for the voluntary participation of our residents to do as much as possible. Social distancing, mask wearing. I want our, we are all in this together and we all need to come up with some answers and, and to bring it down even, even lower. Secondly, obviously, we, we do not know at this point what our city budget is going to look like. The city budget is definitely going to take a hit. We have, we have money coming in from taxes. We have money coming in from uh, sales tax and hotel tax, which is bound to be way down. We're going to have to sit down and really plan for where we're going to strip some services or, or, or whittle back. Schools, of course, are important. Public safety is important. So we're going to have to plan very carefully what we're going to do with our budget going ahead. Third is fire and emergency preparedness. The Woolsey fire, in my opinion, was a disaster. The emergency operations center was never even activated during the last fire. So we need to have it much more together because it's not a question of if we're having a fire, it's a question of when and how bad that fire is going to be. So those are the three top topics, but I would say oversight and make sure we're spending money the right ways. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Thank you. First of all, I have to say that my fellow can, uh, candidates here have some great ideas. And as a city council member, we're going to have to work on many, many things, not just three. Yes. What I'd like to do first and foremost, though, would be to hire a grant writer. Um, if we hire somebody of that position, they'd be able to locate state and federal programs that could provide money to pay for things like traffic mitigation, fire prevention, public safety, and emergency preparedness. With those funds, we'd be able to accomplish a lot of the things that my fellow candidates are uh, proposing. Getting into specifics, my second goal would be to improve our city's wireless service. And the way that I do that is, first of all, improve our city infrastructure. It's something that we're definitely behind on. High-speed internet is not a luxury, it's a necessity. It was critical during the Woolsey fire because many of our residents had spotty Wi-Fi coverage and were unable to get critical updates. I'd task our city staff with developing, with developing a citywide infrastructure that would utilize underground conduits to keep the blight out of our open space. The third thing that I'd do is work harder to improve public input as we rewrite the 2021 housing element into our general plan. This document needs a lot of public input to determine what we're going to build and where, and what we're not going to allow to be built and where not. And the, the first step in that process, I believe, is to get more city residents involved in the process. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now we're on to question two. So two years ago, the Woolsey fire was very destructive in Calabasas. We lost nine homes and there was damage to our parks and the Creekside Preschool. Hundreds of residents were, re were required to evacuate. What steps does the city need to take to prepare for the possibility of such a destructive fire reoccurring again? And what would you do if elected to improve the city's disaster preparedness plan? We'll start with Dennis. Thanks for the softball. <laughs> I appreciate that. The Woolsey fire was 2018, started what, November 8th or 9th and went for weeks it seemed like. And we did lose a lot, both in the built environment and the parklands that we just invested literally uh, millions of dollars to you know, fix on the Las Virginas Creek uh, parklands and stream area. And there's no dealing with a wildfire when the wind is 60 and 80 miles an hour and you literally see the embers running down the Ventura freeway at 60 miles an hour and catching way ahead of any of the fire suppression efforts. So we need to uh, focus on the new technologies 
There are fire suppression gels that can actually help us deal with saving our homes and structures. There are ways to stop the, I mean, we count on the 101 freeway uh, for one thing, but um, that if the wind is blowing east to west, um, it's spreading the fire all the way to Westlake Village and beyond. And that's one of the problems that we faced this last time. And there's no stopping the brands that fly over the freeway either. On both sides of the freeway, we uh, had losses. <clears throat> so that's why I propose that we launch a fire life safety zone strategic planning effort. I'm calling it an action plan where you don't just deal with the one element of either um, where your emergency services are or where your policies um, are affected by the shared um, services agreements we have with fire and uh, police and sheriff and CHP. We develop our own list of needs and interests and then the costs for doing those things and have those plans ready so that when the fire or the earthquake or the floods or the landslides, all of which we've had to do with HIP, we're ready. Thank you. Susan? Thank you. One of the main reasons I decided to run for office initially was because of the poor response to the Woolsey fire. We were one of many evacuated from our home and off of Parkway Calabasas. And then for five or six days afterwards, where we were not allowed to go back to our homes, or if we did go back to our homes, then it became, we couldn't take our cars out. And it, it, it just wasn't well thought, thought through. As I mentioned before, the emergency operations center was never activated. And if you go to the city's website and read the uh, Woolsey after fire report, it's, it's not good. It's not good at all. So we need to do no more. Now, I do know that the city sent out a brochure about residents on fire safety. And I think that's a good thing. I have contacted the city of Calabasas and asked, where is the safe fire safety plan on the website? Who is in charge? Who's taking control of certain things? And I was told, oh, that, only, that information is only available to city personnel, not the public. I think we need complete transparency here too. I wanna to know who's in charge. I wanna know where the Emergency Operation Command Center is working. There was a huge article in the LA Times on Sunday about Topanga's, the city of Topanga's fire emergency preparedness. They have an operational fire emergency center that everyone knows where that is in the city. They have fairs about and where they have speakers, which of course we can't do under COVID, but fire suppression techniques, fire hardening techniques, how to protect your home, how should have, you should have an evacuation plan. We need to adopt that. They are doing an excellent job in Topanga and we can do a lot more to save lives of our residents. We, we live in paradise, but we don't want a repeat of what happened in paradise in Northern California. I have a lot of ideas, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. I think this topic comes back to the same thing as many of our conversations. The two things that we need the most in our city are communication and funding. Communication because if we have the best plan in the world, it doesn't make any difference unless we can get that information out to our citizens. I think uh, one of the things that we need to do is, is improve our emergency evacuation plan. Uh, that plan needs to have all of our communication channels well documented and all of our leaders stipulated. It also needs to have a plan for things like opening emergency roads for evacuation. We have fire roads through our hillsides that could be used in the, in, if needed in evacuation, but our fire department needs to be the one to open those, to, to utilize those. And somebody needs to be there to direct the residents. I think the Woolsey fire was an extreme example. It overwhelmed our fire departments as well. Uh, any measure of planning would have difficulty coming up with a plan to, uh, to avoid the kind of issues that we had during the Woolsey fire. But one of the things that we can do today and moving forward is restrict development in our hillsides. Uh, a good plan with our development code, with our open space planning, and with reducing the line of fire that we have in our open, in our open space and hillsides will greatly impact the amount of effort that the fire department has to put forth in fighting these fires. A combination of all of these things needs to be done. And of course this needs to be paid for. So I'm afraid I have to circle back again. We need a grant writer here in the city to tap into those state and federal funds that can help pay for programs like this. Thank you. 
Thank you. Alicia? Great. Thank you. Well, one thing with the Woolsey fire, we are very lucky that it broke out after school because had it broken out during school, we would have had to contend with a whole other set of issues that we are working on with the school districts and other businesses. Um, number two, the EOC was activated immediately. I spent about a week sitting in the EOC. So the city definitely activated it right away. The one thing that we are looking at that is really important is whether or not the city should be divided into evacuation zones. I sat I was, um, as Mayor Pro Tem at the time, I was part of the after action plan for the Woolsey fire where all the different different cities and the county met with the emergency personnel, sheriff and fire, and we went over everything that worked and everything that we didn't. So in the next few weeks, we are going to be having a meeting with the county's emergency operations team about whether or not the city of Calabasas would be better served being broken into the zones. So when you hear an evacuation order, zone one, zone two, or zone three, it's very clear. So I believe that needs to happen. I've led the charge to re-look at our wireless services because they are subpar and they failed us during the Woolsey fire. So we are working on that. And there is, we need to get more people signed up for our emergency notifications and our city news so that everyone is getting information in multiple ways. We had a emergency preparedness fair that was really well received at the city. And it talked about emergency plans, how to fireproof your home. And we need to continue doing more of these so that this just becomes a part of people's everyday, everyday work, improving their homes for fire safety. But this is something that we have to continue working on day in and day out because it's not it's not if it's going to happen, it's when, and we need to be even better prepared. So I know we can all talk about this subject forever, but lots to do. Thank you. All right, we're on to question number three. At a recent budget review at a city council meeting, it was projected that the sheriff's budget would increase from $4.7 million to $5 million over the next three years, due to officer liability insurance rates increasing. What are your plans to monitor, to monitor and cap the sheriff's budget to keep Calabasas safe? And we're gonna start this time with Susan. Okay, thank you. Um, obviously um, the sheriff's budget um, is coming in at about $5 million and what our projected budget was from a year ago was about $25 million. So, so the sheriff's budget is is 20% of our, the budget for the city. Um, obviously, protective services and the sheriff is, is one thing that our, our community enjoys very highly and I wouldn't want to cut their budget. Now, I do know that recently there was a question about um, raising money for the sheriff's department because they were considering getting um, riot gear and they felt that they needed to obtain that for their office. So I called the Sheriff's Department out there and spoke to uh, Detective DiMatteo and I asked him about this and he said um, that, that, well, he said he didn't know anything about it, but he did call me back and he said the reason they wanted to get that uh, equipment, because I asked, do you feel that there's the likelihood of rioting or destruction breaking out in Calabasas, Zagur or Westlake and he said, no, not at all. But he said, sometimes if there were say rioting in West, Le or in West Hollywood, we might have to deploy five or six officers out there and we want to equip them with, the officers are supposed to show up with the gear that they need. And I said, well, then do they show up with their own flash bangs and rubber bullets? And he said, yes. Yeah. So I wasn't really in favor of funding the police department or the sheriff's department more money for that, but he said that that was going to be done through the foundation. Now, um, I, I am very much in favor of having good law enforcement. Um, I don't think the city of Calabasas has a um, big issue with them, but of course everybody needs oversight and everyone can do better. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Thank you. So first, let's talk about our community and how this fits in. Uh, peaceful intervention should always be the goal. So when it comes to the topic of non-lethal weapons that was just brought up, I think our sheriff's department needs our support. Um, locally, I don't think we're seeing the issue that other parts of the country are seeing. 
uh, but the sheriffs need to be prepared for these things. I do believe in expanding our social programs, but I don't believe in reducing our police budget. Certainly do not want to reduce our police force and our support of their services at this time. At times like these, our police need more training and more oversight to help them navigate these difficult situations. While we'll walking the neighborhoods, what I've heard, the issues are about sheriff's engagement and timeliness of response. They, they want more police presence, they don't want less. Uh, and, and I believe that's what we need here in Calabasas. So I would suspect that our budget for the Sheriff's Department is going to go up. It's going to continue to go up. Um, I'm not in favor of what uh, has typically been labeled defunding the police. And I think it's important that the people that are listening now understand that our county is the one who is funding the Sheriff's Department. The city of Calabasas is merely contracting with the Sheriff's Department. So as a city council member, I'd use my position to, uh, to negotiate and lobby with our sheriff's department of the services that they provide within our city. And I'd use that same presence on our city council to negotiate and work with our county supervisors on how they run the sheriff's department. Thank you. Alicia? There's nothing more important to me than public safety and protecting it and enhancing it in our community. I think that's one of the big reasons why people move out to our community. And I do not support in any way cutting costs to our sheriff's contract. Insurance costs continue to go up with the liability trust associated with the sheriffs. And we've been successful in the past of negotiating with them and spreading some of those extra charges that have nothing to do with our services over more than one year, because sometimes the increase has just been too much for the city to bear. So through good relationships, we've been able to negotiate that. One thing that I'm really proud of during my time on the city council is my relationship that I've developed with the Lost Hill Sheriff Station. And the way we, we talk to them a few times a week, at least on issues. And when they need something that's gonna help protect and enhance the safety of Calabasas, they come to us. And that's been really productive. When they needed additional um, fingerprinting technicians, we were able to help fund that with our neighboring communities. When we're looking at some additional cameras to help with street racing and neighborhood break-ins, we're able to work on that as a partnership. So I think it's so important. The reality is, we're never going to be able to have a deputy on every street in our city. So we have to look at increasing neighborhood watch organizations and utilizing public safety technology because we want to look at the whole picture of how we can keep our community safe. But I do not support any cuts to our sheriff's department. I think they do an incredible job and we need to support them to so we can have faster response rates and all the extra things that we need in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis? I appreciate the question because it's um, indicative of the, of the complexity of dealing with uh, public safety, law enforcement, and the actual patrols and activities in our communities and on our campuses. Um, just as we are parsing what we can do with the LA County Sheriff's uh, providing our primary uh, services. We still have the California Highway Patrol that patrols our scenic highway of 101 and Calabasas Road in part because the on and off ramps deal with that. We have emergency services personnel and ambulance services as well, all of which are critical to the uh, safety of our people and the confidence that they have in us, the leaders of this community in providing for uh, the stuff that may not be as glamorous as providing patrols and or on-campus um, sheriff deputies and so forth, all of which are critical. And how much can we afford? It only really comes down to then budget management, which is part of the question. I think that one of the issues that we now face is doing an audit, not of the sheriff or of any of the other agencies, but of our needs and determining what we should do. And that's why I'm proposing the action plans that I am on our, um, our various um, light, fire life safety corridors, our scenic corridors as well. Because if we understand that CHP is the critical uh, factor in, in that area or the people who come from out of town when we have a fire or from um, the law enforcement agencies that also have shared services agreements with us all here. 
what are the real impacts of dealing with that? And that's hard work. We've, uh, we've allocated more than adequate amounts of money to deal with the public security and safety in our community. Now we have to make sure that it's effective and efficient. And that I pledge to do that and have done that, you know, for the past 30 years in this city. Thank you, candidates. Here's question number four. The city is in the process of updating the housing element of the general plan for 2021 to 2029 as required by state law. As a city council member, what would you do to help the city meet the current state mandate to provide 350 affordable housing units that serve Calabasas residents, including seniors who wish to age in place and or other qualifying tenants. Please include your suggestions for locations in your answer. And we're gonna start this round with Peter. Thank you for that. So I am considering the best reasons to challenge our arena numbers. And I think SB 474 is our best hope. SB 474 would prohibit the approval of a new project in a very high fire hazard severity zone like Calabasas. Zoning determines what can be built on an undeveloped land or in redevelopment. I voted against the Rasnick redevelopment project on Park Sereno because I believed it did not comply with our general plan. I was outvoted and that project was approved. We can also look at other areas that we can expand on like converting empty commercial space to residential units. If, uh, if elected to city council, I would work with our planning commission as we rewrite our development code, as we rewrite our general plan, I should say, in the housing element to make sure that it aligns with our development code. I believe that many of the challenges that we face are not simply of the number of units, but of projects that come before us that don't comply with the general plan, but somehow manage to comply with the nuances of the development code. So my approach would be to lead the charge to make sure that the two documents reflect each other so that the development code that we use in reviewing a project has the same intent as the general plan that the citizens of Calabasas have put together and the housing element that the citizens of Calabasas will have input on. Thank you. Alicia, Alicia? Great, thank you. Can you hear the echo? Yes. Let's try this. Okay, I think it's been fixed. Um, this is definitely one of the big issues that is facing our community. The arena numbers, we were able to get the number significantly down, but it is still a large amount of housing that the state is required. And one thing that I spoke about earlier is really the importance of local governments remaining in control of land use issues and really advocating really advocating on behalf of what will work in our community. And I know it was brought up earlier, but ensuring that housing is not built in high fire zones. And we've been working really closely with our state senator and assembly member on this issue. I think the housing that when we are required to build it, the housing that does need to be built is senior housing it was mentioned so that people can age in place. That's one of the most wonderful things about Calabasas is people don't wanna leave. They want to stay here just in different forms of housing. The other housing product that has been widely ignored in our community is workforce housing. I think it's really important that we provide housing so that our teachers, our law enforcement, our nurses, and firemen can live in this community. And that's something that people are un unable to do right now. We're looking to annex the Craftsman's Corner area. You asked for a specifics, and that's the area for people that aren't familiar across the 101 freeway. That I think would be an ideal area. I also like the idea that Peter has mentioned about now we see that office space might not be needed exclusively for office. I think we have to get creative. It's not gonna be housing like we're used to, we really have to get creative to solve this crisis and to not impact our open space and our high fire severity zones. But there's a way to make it happen. We just have to be creative and diligent. Thank you. Dennis? 
this is one of the most complex issues that we have to deal with in the city, and that is shelter for our people and for the people who want to come here and for the classes or types of, of families or individuals that need to find a place where they can afford to live and work without having to do two hour, three hour commutes every day, even though that's been dampened by COVID, hopefully <clears throat> we're gonna work our way out of that problem, but we don't know. It has made us all change. And here we are on Zoom tonight talking to one another. Think of all the mileage we saved and no gas and no electricity in my case with the Tesla. So I'm telling you, we need to look at all of our resources and how to how, how we're gonna deal with the future of, uh, of sheltering our people. I can tell you that uh, the city of uh, Pasadena, their RENA requirements are 9,400 units in the same time period that we're being asked to uh, do 350. And while we're in fire hazard zones and we have you know very constrained evacuation routes and all that other stuff, um, in the end, you know the state is saying, I've got to build, the state of California has to build a million and a half units in the next nine years, probably, and they'll adjust that up and down. That's a lot of units. Think of what LA has to deal with. So we're looking to build intelligently, and I think technology can help us. Right now, we're paying in Calabasas 600 to 900, maybe even a thousand dollars a square foot. If we can have a mix of housing where we have technology, steel houses that don't melt or burn in the fires, and can be constructed in weeks, not months or years. Those are things that um, you know, our sheriff's deputies, our teachers, our workforce folks who serve us in the restaurants, they can possibly afford to buy or rent in Calabasas if we, uh, again, do an audit of what we need to do in order to meet our requirements and move ahead. Thank you. And Susan. Thank you. Okay, obviously, um, as we go into this next session of the city council, um, we're going to have to take a look at our general plan. That's going to have to be revised and looked at. The biggest issue there is the fact that Calabasas, the entire city of Calabasas, is in a very high fire danger severity zone. Peter has mentioned Bill uh, 474. That's still sitting in committee. But a bill that has passed out of both the House and the Senate at the state level is Senate Bill 182, which was um, written by Hannah Beth Jackson. She is a senator from the Santa Barbara area. And that is really addressing, can we build safely in high fire areas, which Calabasas is. So we're gonna have to be looking at this at a completely different lens as we um, explore and go where climate change is taking us. I'm not sure that we, we can build much more with the infrastructure that we have in Calabasas right now. Yes, we do have local land issues. Yes, we do have 353 units of arena requirements that are supposed to go in. But um, I has mentioned before, as Alicia did, that Craftsman's Corner, though not part of the seat of Calabasas now, but is expected to be annexed in, that is a real hodgepodge of old construction and underutilized area. I think that that would be a great area to put some of this, these arena requires housing in. Um, the other thing that we have to look at is seniors. A third of the population in our city is over 55. That's going to grow. Seniors want to stay in Calabasas and have affordable housing. So I not only want to look out for the workforce people who want to come here, I want to make sure that our seniors can stay in this area and live the rest of their lives in where they have enjoyed so many years. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now we're on to question five. How do you plan to continue to prevent homelessness from taking hold in Calabasas, similar to how it has taken hold in other Valley cities? Alicia, we'll start with you. So this is something that I've worked really, really hard on when I, oh wait, can we put the timer on? Oh, great, okay. Um, 
this is something that I've worked really hard on. I remember when I went to my first Council of Governments meeting and I said, let's talk about homelessness. Everyone looked at me like I was crazy because this is just something that had not been discussed in our community and our region. And I said, you have to look at what's happening in Woodland Hills because what's happening right outside of our city borders is going to happen in our community. And sure enough, it has happened. And we've been really, really proactive on it. We've set up a homeless task force. And for the first time we met with our service provider, which is LA Family Housing, to make sure we had that link that when there was an issue in our community, we could pick up the phone and call. We have a service form on our website when community members encounter somebody who they feel needs help. We're trying to be really, really proactive through the Council of Governments, I helped advocate instead of doing another study on our region to hire a homeless outreach coordinator. So now we have someone that goes from Hidden Hills, Calabasas, Malibu, Agora, and Westlake. And he's hands-on in the field, speaking with people and connecting them with our service provider to help get people the services and the housing that they need. So we have taken a really, really hands-on approach. Um, we've there have been encampments in our community that we've been able to get people the help that they need and remove them from the high fire zone. We've been able to do things that other communities haven't because we've been working on it and we've met with law enforcement. We've done briefings with our staff. We also, for the first time, participated in the homeless count. Calabasas has never participated. So that took place in our community. We're gonna keep doing the work to get people the services they need and keep our community safe. So that's what's happening outside it doesn't happen here. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis? And I'm just gonna thank Alicia for raising the awareness of all of this in the community and for the concrete actions that have been taken so far. But um, I can tell you that we ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, we have 41 million people out of work in the, in the United States. And one of the best places to actually live outdoors or in the rough is right here in the Santa Monica Mountains. So, I mean, we're in for it. Um, Anything we can do to strategically address this as a community will be helpful. One of the best things we can do, in fact, is to do our fair share in dealing with the kind of shelter that might be necessary, or at least uh, do the studies necessary to understand what works best. And we're equipped to do that in City Hall and in some of the other public serving areas that we actually have supported over the past 30 years. So. Um, exercising the, play, the things that are in place and then imagining the kinds of things that are going to happen. I can tell you that there are homeless veterans and I'm a disabled American veteran from the Vietnam War. So I am very much attuned to the importance of taking care of the veterans that we have in our San Fernando Valley and 101 corridor cities areas. And there are people who are addressing that like homes for families in the San Fernando Valley, but you know, they're building 70, 80, 200 units. And it's important because they've broken the ground and they're, they're working with Habitat for Humanity to also deal with that kind of stuff. But you know, if we have to build 60,000 units essentially in LA, LA County, we're gonna have a long way to go to try to deal with the homelessness, which means shelter. And then sustenance, which is how do we take care of those people and their kids and their education and their food and all the other things. So. We need to make a, a literally a, a major emergency planning effort because we have the time, effort, and the desire to do so. So I think that we got a great start. We need to do a lot more. Thank you. Susan? Okay, thank you. Um, the issue of homelessness. My office is in Woodland Hills at the corner of Topanga and Victory, and the street right behind us for several years was just filled with motor homes and little camper trailers that were full of homeless people living on that, in those homes. I mean, they just were on hard economic times. They had nowhere to live and they lived on, our, on the street behind us. And I felt really bad for those people that they had nowhere to go, that they couldn't go to somewhere they, they could at least hook up their vehicle and empty the toilets or take a shower and to provide for this. Now I have recently spoken to Sheila Kuehl's office and asked her about the homelessness. And I too, like Alicia, looked at the counts of homeless people in Calabasas, Agoura Hills, Westlake. And they're actually 
very low numbers, but of course we are going to have transient people who may park a car or a motor home or decide to camp out in the hills from time to time. And, and we need to care for these people. A lot of these people may have drug or alcohol problems. They may have some degree of mental illness. I'm sure that most of us have a friend or a family member that has had struggled with mental illness for some time. So I agree with Dennis, we have a lot of work to do in this regard. Now, going back to Sheila Shul's office, I asked her about homeless services for this area. And she said that um, they had no plans to have, build a homeless share, shelter in this area, that Malibu has far more homeless. And that's, but they do have homeless coordinators that we can use through the county. I've also talked to Bob Bloom because he has set up a drug and treatment center at Tarzana Hospital to help these people too. So there is much more we need to do and there will be more homeless in our community in the year ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And Peter? Well, first I wanna thank Susan for her comments because she brought up the most important point. And I think that is that we all must first be compassionate about homelessness. We need to understand that people are homeless for many reasons. Reasons of mental health, addiction, tragic or unfortunate circumstances, or simply the overwhelming demands of daily life. As I've gone around and talked to a number of residents here in Calabasas, most of them were not aware that we had a, uh, an opportunity to help the homeless with our encounter button on the Connect with Calabasas app. Those that did know about it weren't aware that it would trigger uh, 911 and police department uh, dispatch or whether it would trigger a social worker to go out and help them find the services that they need. So I think one of the biggest things we must do as a city is improve our communication about what we're doing on the front of homelessness. I mentioned before, uh, safe parking programs are a great opportunity. Uh, as was mentioned here, a lot of our homeless live in cars and safe parking programs began, began in, Cal in, excuse me, began in Santa Barbara um, and have been very effective the last couple of years in Los Angeles. Simply uh, safe parking programs allow for overnight parking with uh, restroom facilities and uh, security so that, so that the homeless that are living in their cars have a place that they can go. I think this is a great opportunity for us to uh, work with our neighboring cities, uh, to work collectively on a program that would, that would help the homeless in this capacity. And I think that uh, it's important to realize that our homeless community does not know where our city borders start and stop, <clears throat> which means that we need to work with all of our adjoining communities, including Woodland Hills and Malibu and the 101 corridor cities to develop a cohesive plan that's going to help the homeless that will allow them what they need to survive um, and, and address a number of the concerns that our residents have. Thank you. Thank you. We have no, question number six now. The city of Calabasas is lacking the proper cell service for our residents. What are your thoughts on this issue and how do you plan to implement change? And we're gonna start with Dennis this time. Would you ask the question again, please? Absolutely. The city of Calabasas is lacking the proper cell service for our residents. What are your thoughts on this issue and how do you plan to implement change? Well, as a planning commission member for many years now, and a council member for a long time, um, we have addressed the shelter needs of our community. We've had general plan and housing element number one, which changed the way LA County did business in our territory. And we've, been, we've built actually a significant amount of housing in all categories, whether they're apartments or condominiums or single family residential or zero lot line, you know, condominium and, and, and residential communities. We, we deal with that almost every time we meet at the Planning Commission. And there is a balance in this community now, but it's going to be upset by the conditions that we're facing and they're beyond our control. So we need to be ready for that stuff. And that means doing what not just the state is asking us to do with our RENA share, whether it's 350 units or 600 units in the next uh, periods of time, 
we need to understand why we're doing it and for whom and how does that fit into the strategic plan of the city of Calabasas and what can we afford to support? And, you know, we are actually uh, pretty um, middle of the road when it comes to fees for the, uh, the, the studies of the applications that are made to build housing and or shelter people, or frankly, to shelter business and industry, because all of that matters. And we have to deal with the implications of revenue that comes from those activities as well. We only get 5% of the property tax. The rest goes to the county and to the state. So, you know, we're behind the eight ball when it comes to actually having funds to experiment with. So we have to be very careful about how we ultimately put our plans together. I would encourage everyone to come to the housing element or tune in to the housing element planning commission meetings and council meetings that will occur in the next 10, 12 months. Thank you. Susan, did you catch that question? I thought it was about cell service, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. I, I right. thought you said shelter, so I'm not hearing I'm sorry, that. that's my fault. Well, when I when we talk about cell service, then I'll come back and deal with that one. Sorry about that. Well, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I know it's about cell towers and cell service. Obviously, my husband and I have lived in Calabasas for 23 years, and our frequent jo joke is to say, they can put a man on the moon and communicate with him, but we can't get cell service. We, where we live, we frequently drop cell service, and my husband was very concerned I had the good setup for tonight so it didn't drop. I went back and reviewed two years ago's council speeches to the city, and James Bazadian had a really good talk about cell service, and he said um, that basically, what we need is more cell towers and that cell towers are very expensive to put up and that the private <clears throat> services that put up cell towers aren't really interested in doing more for us because those are costly endeavors. So I don't know if things have changed significantly in the last two years, but certainly my cell service has not. Um, but that is absolutely a problem. And um, James had also talked about that perhaps we could get some towers put up and have the cost of that, or that we could provide incentives to have more cell towers put up because we're a very hilly area and it's hard to have cell towers reach all the, the little valleys that, that, that have to get to all of them. And he said that perhaps that he, we could get with incentives, the cell companies to share a tower so that um, they could co-mingle the cost of the tower and the use of the tower, and perhaps that would be more attractive to putting more towers up. But James had said, that's, we don't have a lot of control over that unless we want to start paying for the towers ourselves. And I don't know if that's feasible or what the cost of that would be. But if I get on the city council, I'm certainly going to look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Well, I think now would be a great time to have an engineer on city council. The, uh, the cell service coverage that we're all having difficulties with is uh, actually running on, on fiber optic cabling. And by that, I mean, sure, we use wireless to connect to the cell tower, but the cell tower connects to the next cell tower with a cable. And frankly, the simple problem is that the city of Calabasas does not have enough infrastructure to support it. What's changed in technology is the cell towers now are much smaller than they ever used to be, much less powerful, much less disruptive, but they need more cabling to connect them. So that's again, why I'd circle back to my earlier discussion of what I wanna do on city council, a citywide infrastructure of fiber optic cabling that reached to all of our corners would allow us to improve cell coverage and improve our high-speed internet coverage in our homes and give us more options other than spectrum cable to connect with simultaneously. That infrastructure is severely la lagging in Calabasas and needs to catch up to the current technology in some of our neighboring cities. That would be one of my first jobs here on city council would be to get that program going. And as I mentioned earlier, it is costly to put those cables in the ground. For that, I would make sure that we got a grant writer to cover a number of those costs and then we would use those conduits and fiber optic cables that are already in the ground as a tool to negotiate with our wireless service providers. We've made it so difficult for them for so many years to provide services here. We need to open the door and we need to create a plan that allows them to build, to, to put their towers in here without disrupting our scenic corridors. 
that would be my plan. Thank you. Finally, Alicia. Thank you. I think this is the one issue that all residents in our community can agree on, that we have awful <laughs> cellular and wireless service. I actually led the charge on the current city council to relook at our wireless ordinance. This was something really important to me. And I don't look at this as a luxury or an inconvenience having bad service. I look at this as something that failed us in the event of an emergency and something that we need to address. I called a meeting with the wireless providers to speak to them. And I learned that we have one of the most restrictive ordinances in the entire country, because about 10 years ago, the push was no more towers because of all the safety issues, but there's new technology now, and that's not the case anymore. And all of the wireless providers agreed that with a change in our ordinance, they would be able to invest in the current infrastructure and help build new infrastructure that would provide increased service. They said there's no doubt that it's a result of our current ordinance that is preventing this current investment. So once we had this meeting, we did a citywide survey to all residents to make sure that residents felt as strongly. And as we suspected, they did. So the survey results came back saying it was not just in one part of the community. People throughout the entire city were having the same issues. So we, um, right now, the revisions to the ordinance are with our Communications and Technology Commission, and they are going to be working on a set of changes. There will be a lot of public outreach and discussion on this, and then ultimately it will come back to the city council. But it's something that everybody is in agreement on that we need to make changes so that these and that these changes also have to be safe and protect the aesthetics in our community but i believe there's a way to achieve all of that thank you thank you here's question number seven candidates how do you feel about the city's lack of strengthening their planning process the city of los angeles and the city of malibu have laws to ensure neighbors views are not destroyed and much clearer rules regarding the use of slopes and lot utility requirements. If you are elected, will you address these things that cause neighbors to be pitted against one another? Susan, let's start with you. Okay. Um, I've done a lot of walking around in here, and one of the things that I commonly come across is where neighbors say, uh, you know, why are they building on ridgeline developments and why are these people allowed to block our views? And I do know that a lot of other cities have ordinance against that. Um, you know, I've certainly heard of, of, of things happening like where the people who are living downhill from the, the upper level housing, somehow someone goes down there and cuts down their trees during the night or when they're away so that that no longer obstructs their views. So instead of having pitting, as you say, Lori, um, neighbor against neighbor, we need to have some concrete rules in place so that people are clear on what they can and cannot do as far as obstructing views, as far as building. And yes, I would say that that has to go into the planning department because there have been a lot of complaints to me as I walk around the streets that why isn't the planning uh, department doing this and why isn't, aren't they doing that? And it could be that the planning department just doesn't have the laws and ordinances and rules in place that they can effectively deal with that. So I think that that's something that we absolutely have to take a look at in planning and going forward. And of course, we always have to look at the fire element as we plan any housing going forward also. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Thank you. Um, I would have to say that our planning commission has to function with the development code that we have. Our city council has the ability to make changes to that development code. And as a city council member, there's so many areas I would love to improve. As a planning commissioner, one of the things that I've been working on for years is to change our permeability, our, our code that requires permeable surfaces. Our current definition has a loophole that allows developers to pretty much pave their entire lot. And we've actually seen projects come through like that. And we've seen them built out to every imaginable setback, front, side, and rear. We've seen them with giant spaces underneath the building that aren't considered part of the buildable space. But we know that it's part of the volume of the mass that's blocking the views from the neighbor. 
And as projects like those have shown up before the Planning Commission, I have voted against them in every case. What I'd like to do as a city council member is help strengthen our development code to make it more in line with our general plan, to take elements like the pervious services and tighten up those definitions so that those loopholes can't be exploited anymore. When it comes to the views, people need to understand that the only protection we have in Calabasas right now is from a scenic corridor to our ridgeline. And the Planning Commission is currently working on the ridgeline ordinance right now. And we've successfully been able to change the view of the review. At one point, it was considered that we need to change the ridgeline ordinance because people that are on a mapped ridgeline that you can't see from the lower levels shouldn't be inconvenienced with the need to put up story poles. But I've taken the opposite approach. I'm concerned with the projects that are up on the hillside that we're viewing that might not be on a mapped ridgeline, but are changing the views from our scenic corridors and our open space. And I'm dedicated to protecting those and to strengthening our code so that none of that slips by anymore. Thank you. Alicia? Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of during my work on the city council is being part of the subcommittee that brought forth our civic engagement process. So that before an application is received by the city, there needs to be a public workshop that the community has to be involved or has the opportunity to be involved, that we increased the radius for mailings. So you're not gonna be surprised if a project is coming forward in your neighborhood. I think the most important thing in our community is residents getting involved and letting their voices be heard. And there've been so many changes that have resulted from this and more changes that will come from this as well. When I was on the planning commission, we developed the story poll ordinance because this was something that was happening in Malibu and surrounding cities. I think it's really important for people to understand what is going to be built so that they can properly weigh in on the projects. View protection is something that anytime you knock on doors, people want to talk about. And that's something that the city does not currently have in place. Peter explained it in great detail, so I won't go through it again. But I think it's really important that all of these issues that were raised in this question, that people bring these issues forth even more to the planning commission and city council, because that's the beauty of being a part of a small city like Calabasas versus the city of LA. Your planning commission, your city council, your staff listens and hears from residents and responds to them. So I think that the more that these issues come to the table, the more they can be discussed and vetted and possible changes to the development code if necessary. But it's important for people to be involved in the process. Thank you. Thank you. And Dennis. Well, again, is another good commercial for the meetings that are going to be happening with the Planning Commission and the Council for the next year or two. And that is um, of the 350 plus or minus units that need to be built um, in Calabasas according to the current state mandates or your housing element is invalidated and you can't issue a building permit. Um, the penalty is actually pretty severe to think about that. But if we only have 350 units that we're talking about, it's not like we faced, you know, over the past 30 years where, you know, we've moved anywhere from, you know, 20 to 50 million cubic yards of earth to actually put in the houses and the, and the shopping centers and the industry that we have in this community and you deal with that and it starts to look pretty complex. Well, if you look at it just from a housing element standpoint, we have an opportunity now. And there, there is, even though it's a, a horrible burden to look at where we're gonna put 350 units uh, to meet state mandates, uh, you still have the opportunity to engage the community, engage the best minds in the community because there's a lot of creative solutions that can help us deal with some of this. And Alicia mentioned, as we have all been looking um, at annexations as a means of getting territory that is pretty much ungoverned by LA County and bring it back into you know, local control. And that's one of the ways out of the problem in part, but it's also an opportunity to think about how we are going to look and operate in the next four years, 10 years, 20 years. 
and not get fined or penalized for doing the right thing, which we are doing now and have been for years and years here. Thank you. Well, we've reached our final question and this is it. In order to help combat air pollution, which is getting worse, what are your thoughts on the city banning leaf blowers or insist on special filters to reduce pollution from their use? And Peter, we're gonna start with you. Wow, what a great question that is. I don't think any of us were prepared for this one. Uh, <laughs> as a mechanical engineer, I can tell you that if you put a filter on a leaf blower, it's not gonna operate as effectively. So as we analyze this problem, I think it's important that we look at the, imp the, 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 the cause and effect of any ordinance we might put in effect. Putting that aside for a quick moment, I'd have to say that yes, leaf blowers are very annoying. They do have uh, pollution issues and electric leaf blowers are becoming more and more powerful, more and more readily available uh, with rechargeable batteries and, and might be a great solution. Uh, I would certainly entertain an ordinance that would move us in that direction. Uh, the idea of uh, engineering from the city council seat though has to be done with care. So when we talk about pollution and filters and such, we need to look at the types of motors that are being used out there. This could get to be a real complicated question. Mm -hmm. My solution would be to, to, to ask one of our appropriate commissions to weigh in on this, uh, to do a little research for us. And this is one of the issues I've had with our city is that we have all of these ideas that we want to implement and our city staff only has so much time and so many dollars to study these issues and come up with appropriate solutions to research other cities and find out what they've done. So my suggestion would be to take a project like this and tap into our commissions. We have commissions for uh, public safety and transportation and in, we have an environmental commission. What a great commission to use to do that research, to come back with a solid representation to city council on how other cities deal with problems like these. That's how I would tackle this problem and then I would follow their recommendation. Thank you. Alicia? And I, I was writing notes when the question came, so I have some of the same responses, but we get this question periodically from residents and it actually started, I started getting more questions about this during COVID-19. So I actually sent one of the questions to public health to make sure there wasn't any public health issues with things blowing and going to different areas. And they said right now there was no issue related to COVID with these leaf blowers, but I think there are new technologies out there. I'm not an expert on this by any means and I don't claim to be, but I believe there are some new technologies out there and some of our communities with HOAs, I believe have already are starting to look at restricting them. But I wrote in my notes too, this would be a perfect project for our commissions. I wrote environmental commission or public safety. They're always looking for meaningful projects. I think that would be a great way to start and also making sure that there's public feedback on this one because there are, people do complain about this from time to time, but especially, as I said, during the pandemic, we've been getting more calls about this. Thank you. Dennis? This is a perfect opportunity to, to, to go electric, number one, because it's not leaf blowers alone. All the power equipment that comes into Calabasas and every other city in California, um, other than in those few areas where they have um, ordinances in place to try to constrain that. But the people who do the landscaping, they don't live in our town. They come in, they're contractors, and they buy the stuff they can get at Home Depot or at Costco or wherever they you know, buy the things. And just try to get the Air Quality Management District to try to constrain that and you, you know, run into all the accusations that you can imagine. So one of our things to do, I think, is to understand what's driving this and how do we link it to something that's important to everybody in Calabasas so that they hire people or they even help them get the equipment necessary to avoid the pollution and the noise for that matter. It's pretty obnoxious and it's not just the, uh, the gas or emissions discharged from the units, it's all the dust and debris they throw up into the air, whether they're dealing with lawn mowing or air, air blowing or whatever. Um, 
it would be valuable for us to take a look at the recommendations from the AQMD. We get notices at the city council for them all the time. Um, and the bigger issue to all of them is dealing with um, the stationary sources for air pollution and our carbon budget. Here's a, a nice factoid for you. The average Calabasas resident is responsible for 24 pounds of carbon a day. Think about that. And the folks at SCAG, Southern California Association of Governments, have a lot of information. And I think um, David Shapiro was actually our regional council member there. We can task him to bring that home and see what the latest is and who's providing scholarships to help our landscapers change their equipage. Thank you. Susan? OK, the last to go, huh? Yes. Anyway, um, I was driving to work today about 7.30 in the morning and I had my windows down and some uh, people were working and blowing the street out and they were making so much dust and I had to immediately roll my windows up because that was all going to come inside my car. Now, that didn't happen in Calabasas. Now, when I drive down Parkway Calabasas to go to and from my home, I find that our contractors, uh, Venco Western, are very good when they're leaf blowing. If there's a car coming, they get out of the way and they turn that leaf blower away from traffic. So I really like that. And I really like the fact that um, electric leaf blowers um, produce less pollution and that they are much quieter. So I think that, that the two things we have to work toward are more electric leaf blowers are just saying we're banning gasoline ones in the city. And two, maybe just a little more training for these people too, because sometimes they're blowing enormous piles of leaves. And I think it would just be easier to pick a lot of that stuff up than to blow it five inches with a high powered leaf blower. So sometimes just a little bit of additional training might do a better job than how they, they operate. But um, I hear leaf blowers going in on my community. They start at seven o'clock in the morning and a lot of them are gas powered and a lot of them are very noisy. And I can certainly appreciate how many homeowners don't appreciate listening to that noise so early in the morning or late at night or on Saturdays and kind of disrupting their harmony that they live in. So I, I would, if I were on the city council, I'd certainly look at trying to control that and control more uh, electric blowers, which would also be a benefit for our environment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of our candidates for staying on time and really appreciate that. And we have come to our closing statements. Each of our candidates will have three minutes to give a closing statement. And we want to thank them again for staying on time. We're going to start with today, um, tonight, we're going to start our closing statements with Peter. Thank you. As an engineer, I have an analytical problem solving mind. I understand the geology and topography constraints that Calabasas faces, but city council is much more than dealing with development issues. As a business owner, I deal with many of the same issues on a daily basis. Poor cell service during the Woolsey fire left many residents with no way to connect to life-saving information or alerts. I'll direct public works to develop a citywide fiber optic master plan, and I'll use it to negotiate better coverage with our wireless providers while enforcing our scenic corridor guidelines. I'll tap into available funding sources to pay for infrastructure projects. I'll work with city council to hire a grant writer to source funding for our much needed projects like traffic mitigation, fire prevention, and emergency preparedness. I've spoken as an expert for organizations like NSF, the National Sanitary Foundation, who led the charge on lead-free faucets and drinking fountains at our schools. I'm an expert on the design of, of plumbing systems. As the chairman of ANSI ASPE 45, a national design standard for storm drainage, I authored a document that is now cited in building codes across the country. I've served on several advisory committees, including the Los Angeles Green Building and Water Conservation Ordinance Committees. My past experience is directly related to our city's public works and infrastructure. I've personally labeled, labored as a volunteer and an Eagle Scout mentor, restoring native habitats along Stunt Road and improving trails at De Anza Park as well as completing dozens of projects with neighboring properties of the National Park Service, the Mountains Restoration Trust, and others. If elected to city council, I am committed to restoring and improving all of our parks and trails. Through my past civic and business experience, I have developed the analytical and decision-making skills needed for the job. 
With previous, when previous projects conflicted with our development code and scenic corridor guidelines, my comments and questions have been able to persuade my fellow planning commissioners. In this way, my past experience and my consensus building skills have been instrumental in preserving dozens of acres of open space. That's why I'm endorsed by the League of Conservation Voters, the Calabasas Co Coalition, Save Open Space, and the Sierra Club. I also have endorsements from dozens of past and present council members, commissioners, community leaders, and residents. They know and can attest to my qualifications, commitment, ethics, and transparency. I'm empowered by their trust and I hope to earn yours too. I wanna to be your next city council member. You can find more information about me at peterkraut.com. My contact information is there as well and I invite you to reach out to me at any time. I will quickly and gladly respond. My thanks to the city of Calabasas for hosting this candidates forum and everyone who showed up this evening. You can make a difference in Calabasas, so please share what you've learned here tonight with your family, neighbors, and friends. I'm asking for your vote to city council. In partnership with the community, I am committed to the betterment of our city. Together, we can make a positive change. Please make your vote count. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? Good evening. I am committed to preserving the quality of life here in Calabasas. Raising my family here was awesome. I want to preserve this quality and help the city recover and go forward. One of my first priorities will be to help get COVID under control in our city and further safe reopenings. In these times, we must appeal to our citizens' sensibilities for our collective well being. We are all in this together. Times have changed since 1990. Our lives are affected by emerging new threats and worsening existing ones. The world is grappling with the severe health and economic consequences of the pandemic. We are in a period without historic parallel. We are facing climate change, drought, frequent and extreme fires. We must think globally and act locally there is more our city can do on a local level. Thousand Oaks and Malibu are all 100% clean renewable energy power to their cities. We lag behind at 36%. Climate change is affecting our lives and we have to adjust, such as having to reconsider our master plan concerning future developments and requirements in response to increased fire danger. I believe that being educated and informed could help me be a more, more effective in influencing my community. My master's in public health was focused on policy, management, and finance. I have thought about running in the past, but it seems like my skills and experience could be beneficial to the city now more than ever. Every public policy decision is a public health decision. If we want to change the world around us, we need to show up and vote for candidates that share our vision. This is a very important election for all of us and not because I'm in it. Uh, my appointments all have a lot of city planning experience. We have a lot of their point of view already. We need new points of view. It is time to put a new face with fresh perspectives and ideas on the city council. One that puts the health recovery and preservation of our community first. I want the city of Calabasas to continue to be a leader. There is more to be done. Public health is about the health of the community, all of us and the environment we live in. I am a lifetime member of the Sierra Club. I am endorsed by the Los Angeles League of Conservation Voters, many doctors, healthcare workers, public health advocates and the California Dental Association. I would really appreciate your vote. Please visit my website at votefordrsusan.com. And thank you so much for your consideration tonight. Thank you. Dennis? Well, I thank my colleagues on the screen right now for this lively debate. There needs to be a lot of this in the future of Calabasas and not just during campaign season, although this is a great opportunity to understand one another and to look for the agreements that we have and the differences that we have so we can address them 
in a timely manner, but at the same time, knowing that it's a long time in building and it's a long time in re re improving. And we always reserve the right to improve in Calabasas. So um, here's what I'll do if you elect me to another term on the city council. I will urge the city to launch the fire life safety action zones that I mentioned earlier on our scenic corridors. You know, it's almost ironic that we preserved Amundsen Ranch and Adamson Ranch and Gillette Ranch and uh, we stopped developments on Las Virginis and on the east side of the city here as well. Most of the time we use public money to buy those properties. And that was pretty smart. You know, it isn't a grantsmanship effort but it's using other people's money to have your way. It's kind of the art of diplomacy, if you think about it that way. And these corridors that I'm talking about are Mulholland Highway from Louisville High School all the way to the, uh, the western, southwestern uh, city boundary. Um, and on that corridor, there are probably $300 million worth of school assets that are uh, stranded right now. And we need to get those you know, back into action because it's our money that's paying or investing to have those facilities. The other scenic corridor on the eastern side is Old Topanga Canyon, Valmar. That needs a great deal of planning because we have numerous streams that go um, into the LA River all the way to Long Beach, right from the headwaters of Calabasas. The third is the Calabasas Road, Parkway, Calabasas and 101 Freeway Complex. And it is a complicated place. So we need to start now, not just dealing with uh, the waiting for our general plan to understand what's going on in those corridors. And the, the last and certainly not least is the Las Virginis Malibu Canyon Valley and the roadways and the resources that are there. Our schools are again stranded. Our water district is struggling to try to literally change the way water is uh, turned full circle. And I would say that for fire protection and suppression, we need, we need to have water. We got to do that and we have to be clever about it. And the Pure Water Project, if you haven't seen it, look it up, LVMWD. Um, it's really important. I actually had a drink of the water that they made out of the test project that's in headquarters now. And then I want to work together with our neighboring cities and agencies by initiating council and agency board meetings together. We did that with Agoura Hills and with the school district. We need now, now need to do it with Las Virginis Municipal Water, Hidden Hills, and the other cities, Agoura Hills certainly, um, on um, our corridors. And I look forward to working on that if you put me in office. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia. I wanted to thank my fellow candidates for this great conversation. I am proud of the work that I've done on the city council, and I'm happy that I have stayed committed to the goals that I set out to accomplish during my first, first term, despite all the emergencies that have happened in our community. I have prided myself on being responsive to residents, to residents' concerns, and have helped make City Hall more responsive to residents. I sought to improve transparency, improve communication, preserve our open space, and I worked on public safety and quality of life issues that impact our entire community. And I would like to continue working on these if elected to a second term. As a result of the pandemic, as a city, we've had to change the way we do things, but we've adapted and despite the hardships, no city services have changed. I have been committed to helping our residents stay healthy and our businesses survive. I have advocated against state bills that would take away our local control as it relates to land use decisions. I also made sure that Calabasas was represented regionally by serving as president of our Las Virginis Municipal Council of Governments and helped form a group called Women Mayors Advancing Community where I've worked on regional issues so that Calabasas has a strong voice. Part of what is special and unique to Calabasas is our open space and doing what we can to protect it. We need to ensure that our projects are pro properly vetted. I was proud to be a part of the council subcommittee that developed the city's civic engagement policy that requires all applicants to do notice public meetings before a project is received by the city. I also want to re-emphasize how important public safety is to me. I am always working on ways to improve public safety in our community, and I know there's so much more we can do on this front. We are making progress on street racing. We are working to combat 
residential and commercial break-ins and increased neighborhood watch groups. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is not going anywhere anytime soon, and we need to continue supporting our residents and businesses during this time. One thing that will be very important to address is how to keep our seniors engaged as the senior center might not open for some time. And once it does, how do we support those who do not want to come back in person? We will need to come up with creative programming and opportunities for both in-person and virtual programming. COVID-19 has also caused serious impacts to our city finances, and we're going to have to continue addressing serious budget concerns and make changes as we continue to receive actual budget, budget projections. As everyone knows, the city relies heavily on sales tax and those taxes from hotels and those sectors are performing well below normal. We need to figure out ways to make cuts that do not directly impact services. My background in public policy and previous government experience has helped me work with other government entities and this is very important to support Calabasas. I would really appreciate your vote as I have the support of the entire city council, school board and our amazing residents many of them, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I wanna really thank each of our four candidates tonight for appearing with us and for their engaging discussion of so many issues that are important to our Calabasas voters. And now I wanna give you a few reminders. Um, detailed election information is available on the Calabasas election page, including candidate statements, vote center information, and replay times of this cap candidate forum. Every registered voter will receive a vote by mail ballot, which will start being mailed out on October 5th. Two vote centers will be located in the city, Founders Hall from October 30th through November 3rd, and Agora Hills Calabasas Community Center from October 24th through November 3rd a flex vote center to provide targeted services to seniors and persons with disabilities will be available at the Calabasas Senior Center on October 27th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Also, a 24-hour drop-off box will be available from October 5th through November 3rd in front of the Civic Center on the sidewalk towards the Commons to drop off your vote by mail ba ballots. The last day to register to vote in the November 3rd election is October 19th. And I wanna repeat that again. The last day to register to vote in the November 3rd election is October 19th. For those voting in person on November 3rd, vote centers will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Thanks again to our candidates and to those of you watching at home. Good night and please remember to vote early and stay safe. Thank you, Lori. That was a fantastic evening. I really appreciate you putting this on for us. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Everyone, a beautiful job. Beautiful job. And I, I hope that anybody who's listening still pays attention because it's really important to deal with this, these matters and these people. Thanks again, Lori. You're welcome. And good luck to all. Thank you, Lori. All right. Thanks again, everybody.